Well, we started last time uh, on the influence of demon spirits and uh, at what happens to a person now who's under the influence. Now, we took the most extreme case of demonic activity in the Bible, and we're looking at nine characteristics now, uh, or symptoms or tendencies now of demon oppression. Now, the reason we're doing this, the enemy does not necessarily change his tactics. So how the, those tactics manifest now in these extreme cases is going to show us to a lesser degree, of course, uh, but nonetheless, the tactics that are present in, in cases of mild oppression as well. So it can really be a blessing if we'll take this and really stop and look at this, and then we're going to see where we're being oppressed at times and we don't even realize it. So if we can recognize the symptoms readily in the case of the demoniac, we can know what to watch for when oppression is trying to hit us in a milder form. Now, too often we're guilty of thinking, oh, I'm just having a bad day. So many people just, oh, I'm just having a bad day. No, let's not let the enemy now win on any level. Let's realize that this is the enemy attacks, and we can stand against it. We can recognize it and put our hand up and say no. Now, I remember telling the psychiatrist 30 years ago, oh, I'm just a fearful person. I even remember telling him that. And even this secular psychiatrist said, no one is a fearful person. I thought that was interesting when he said that. And he said, no one is necessarily an angry person. He said, it's an acquired trait. And so uh, it's a acquired all right. It's acquired straight from the devil. But when we know where it's coming from and, and know what it is and know that it's not really us, it's just the enemy attack, we can stop it. We can stand against it and, and get free. Okay, now before we go on, I want to just give us just a little bit of review from last time. In Mark 5, 1 through 3, it's the, the demoniac lived in the tombs and he could not be contained. Okay, tomb or cave dwelling is a characteristic of demonic oppression. Now, that can be a physical tomb dwelling uh, where there's physical uncleanliness, clutter, darkness, you know, gloomy atmosphere and so forth. Or it can also be a spiritual tomb dwelling where a person is drawn into spiritual uncleanliness, where they're, uh, they have mental clutter in their head, confusion, uh, a dark soulish state of, of depression, despair, where they're in self-pity. Those are all symptoms of spiritual tomb dwelling. Now, that's the first characteristic of tomb dwelling. Mark 5, verses 3 and 4, no one could contain him even with chains. That scripture. So the second characteristic of demonic oppression is how strong the demons are. Demons do have physical strength, but they also have a strong uh, seducing strength as well. We have to watch for that. And that's what we're going to focus on today, their strength to influence, their strength to seduce. Now, anytime we feel overpowering urges, it's always from the enemy. God does not overpower. He doesn't force us into anything. He gives us free will. So when we're overpowered, when we're forced into something, we can always know it's a demon spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit draws and He woos us. He convicts us, but He doesn't overpower us. We have a free will. We have a choice. God gave us that. Now, Satan, on the other hand, he tries to make us think that we don't have a choice, that we're just helpless uh, when the enemy comes. So he, the enemy does come with tormenting fears. He comes with extreme lusts. He comes with obsessing compulsions. You know. But remember, Satan is a liar. There's no truth in him, and he wants us to think that we can't do anything about it except yield to the urge. But God has a way of escape from every temptation. But we have to take his promises, and we have to say those promises out loud until the torment leaves. But if we'll, if we'll start saying his promises every time we're being tempted, if we'll say them and then keep saying them, pretty soon it'll lift. It'll go away. Now, sickness even falls under this number two category. There are times that sick symptoms and pain can just seem overpowering, you know. And because the attack is so strong, Satan then puts the thought in our mind that we have no choice in the matter. But that's a lie. That's, that's a lie from the enemy. Uh, sometimes we're, uh, when we're feeling so bad, we think, I'm sick and there's just nothing I can do about it. But that's the enemy whispering those things in our ear. So begin to quote Psalm 91. We need to confess these promises in Psalm 91 until we believe it. This is a covenant given to us by God himself. 
I'll not be afraid of the pestilence. Lord, you promised that it would not even approach me. And when those symptoms are coming, we need to say that and say it until we're convinced. And when we do, pretty soon those symptoms will lift. Now, don't give in to the strength of the demon attacks. You may not be any match against him by yourself. We know that. <clears throat> but you plus God now can overcome anything that the enemy might try to send. Even the man with the legions of demons, the man who had 6,000 demons. Can you imagine having 6,000 demons? He was able to overcome when he continued to call on God. But don't, don't call once or twice and then give up and think, oh, it didn't work. God didn't hear my prayers. It is a fight. We're fighting against a physical enemy who's trying to win. So sometimes you have to put up a fight. You have to stand for a while. But uh, if, if you go into it just determined that you're not going to give up until you win, you'll find out victory will be yours. Victory will come. Okay, now that brings us to the number three characteristic of demonic oppression. And it's in Mark 5, verse 5. Constantly day and night... He was among the tombs crying and gashing himself with stones. You know, you've probably known people who cut themselves. They're called cutters. But what they don't realize, that's a demon spirit. It's exactly the demon spirit that uh, this guy in the tombs had. Okay, the number three characteristic of demonic oppression is a lack of peace, where somebody is just driven day and night. That It's the opposite of rest. Now, that can be anything from literal insomnia for days to just a mild anxiety. Sometimes we don't realize that a man, uh, just a mild anxiety where it just wakes you up at night and you don't get your sleep, that's demonic. We need to realize that. Any amount of lack of peace is coming from demonic oppression. Now, many times we've known people who had an emotional or a mental breakdown, <clears throat> and it was preceded by day and night just absolutely not being able to sleep. They just couldn't sleep. And sometimes uncontrollable crying. Extreme oppression is characterized by the inability to sleep. It's, it's characterized by torment. But I want us to look now at the symptoms that we tend to live with and just think they're normal. Uh, Derek Prince once made the statement that demons fight against peace in every realm and in every aspect. He said at every level, a demon is trying to steal your peace. Now, I don't know why, <clears throat> but many Christians who walk in total peace, they'll sense a lack of peace from the demonic oppression, and, um, uh, and they don't realize that their goal needs to be every single day, I'm going to have the peace that God has given me, peace that passes human understanding. Now, peace is one of the main things that Jesus came to provide. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, one of the very first things announced by the angels was Peace has at last come to earth. I mean, that was the gift that Jesus brought when he came to die on the cross. Now, when God sent Jesus, he sent peace into the world. And Psalm 34, verse 14 says, Seek peace, pursue it, it has been provided. Okay, what a shame not to enjoy what God has provided, and especially peace. Nothing is more wonderful than to be able to have peace in your heart. And God has provided it. But we have to determine, I don't care how the enemy fights against it. I'm going to win this battle because it's a gift from the God of the universe. But I want you to notice so many scriptures that talk about our peace. Psalm 37, verse 37 says, A man of peace will have posterity. And Psalm 119, verse 165, He who loves thy law will have great peace. I mean, it's amazing how many promises there are through the Word. Isaiah 9, verse 6, called Jesus the Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. He's our Prince of Peace. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not the world's peace, God said, but my peace. And sometimes we think we're operating in peace when we don't realize there's a step above that when we get into God kind of peace. And one of the fruit of the Spirit is peace. Love, joy, peace, patience. Okay. Ephesians 2.14 says that Jesus himself is our peace. Jesus is peace personified. He is peace. He doesn't just give us peace, but the Bible tells us he is our peace. And then Philippians 4.7, the peace of God passes all human understanding. So God's peace now is beyond our human comprehension. We can't even, we can't even conceive of it in our mind. It's such a powerful gift. 
Now, one of the ways that God leads us is by our peace. You know, um, when, when you're wanting to know if, if God's leading to do a certain things, start listening way deep down. And if it's not God, you'll sometimes just almost hear an uh-uh. There'll just be an uh-uh down on the inside of you. And when it is God, you, you'll just have this peace. You know you know it's Him. And um, uh, But when your peace is not there, stop. Don't go that direction. Uh, maybe it means it's not time, but whatever it means, it means stop, hold up. Okay, now remember, any amount of lack of peace is coming from some degree now of demonic oppression. Now, demon manifestation is always the opposite of peace. I want to say that again because I want you to hear it. Demonic manifestations are always the opposite of peace. Now, I want to give you a little six-question survey for it to use as a personal examination, you know, between you and God, and just check out your peace or your lack of it. Because peace is so important that we need to spend just a little time here. If, if the angels came and said, finally, peace has come when Jesus came to earth, then that means it's worth waiting for. It's worth getting. Just to ask yourself, what about my inner peace? Do I have peace within myself? You know, uh, can you spend days and nights on end at home alone with nothing in particular to do and just be totally uh, content to be with yourself? After 24 hours, are you climbing the wall? Or can you enjoy just having some thinking time or some reading time uh, or time to just think on things that maybe you don't have time to think on at other times? Uh, can you make it constructive when you're alone, just between you and God? What about peace in your physical body? Do you feel your stomach churning at times, you know? Uh, is there a low-grade anxiety? Some people live with a low-grade anxiety. Years ago, before I went through deliverance, I lived with a low-grade anxiety, and I was so used to it that I didn't even know it was there, you know, until it was gone. And I thought, oh, God, this feels so good. So a lot of people live with they never know that they have that anxiety, is your body rigid? Is it tense and stressed? I can remember during those years, I went for a manicure once, and the girl was doing my nails, and she says, your hands are so tight. She said, can you relax them? And I thought, my hands are tight? I never even noticed that. I didn't know it. Uh, do you bite your fingernails? Do you bite the inside of your cheek? You know, those are signs of lack of peace. What about peace with your fellow man? Answer this inside of yourself, but which term best characterizes your attitude, your, your overall general feeling toward most people most of the time? Is it tolerance? Uh, do you just tolerate people? Or is it genuine love, genuine peace when you're around someone? Now, the term that describes your normal attitude tells a lot about the peace that you have on the inside of yourself. You know, at the first Christmas, a vertical peace was made between God and man, and that vertical peace opened the door then to a horizontal peace that we have with each other. But we've got to have that vertical peace first. Are you constantly having to deal with guilt and condemnation in your soulish realm, where, where you never really feel good about yourself, or, or about you never feel good about something you've done, even though maybe you've asked for forgiveness, you know, can, can you stop and really realize that God wants you to be forgiven and He wants you to have peace? Forgiveness opens the door to that peace. So ask yourself, how well do I adjust to situations and circumstances? Do I handle change well? Every one of us need to ask ourselves that. Is it a real struggle or do I flow with the situation by just trusting God? Lord, I know you're there. I know you're going to help me through this. You're going to give me answers. We need, to, we need to have that settled on the inside of us. That kind of peace that we're talking about comes through the door of trust, where we're trusting God. Overall, take an across-the-board look at yourself. Uh, how are you at your job? How do you do at school? Well, when you're just waiting for a red light, are you just, just can hardly wait for it just to, you just want it to move on, you know? Maybe while you're sitting around the table talking with family, are you, are you saying, I need to get busy. I've got things I need to do. You know, we need to ask ourselves. When you're reading a book, some people can't read a book because they, they are thinking of all these things they need to do. Would the word restlessness describe your general overall feeling? Now, everyone gets restless from time to time. You know, that's normal. But is restlessness a daily overall characteristic? If it is, 
then it needs to be something you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need help. You know, I want to be delivered from this. I want your peace. Demon oppression is characterized by constant restlessness. So a lack of peace is what, to whatever degree, is the number three symptom of demonic oppression. Okay, number four, uh, the characteristic of demonic oppression is in verse five. The demoniac was constantly day and night among the tombs and in the mountains. Constantly day and night. So the number four characteristic of demon oppression is the withdrawal from people always wanting to be alone, a recluse. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to want to be alone at times and even like to be alone at times. We, we all need that. <clears throat> That's healthy. So don't mishear what I'm pointing out here. I'm talking about someone who never wants to be around people. You, you'll know the difference. Now, the tendency to always pull away from godly fellowship and pull away from corporate worship where you, you're worshiping with other people, when a person is predominant tendency is to withdraw from contact with people. That's a sign of oppression. Now, I want you to notice the next time you're a little bit depressed, you want to stay home. You want to close the doors and pull down the shades and not see anyone. When Depression makes us feel that way. When you feel that, do exactly the opposite. We need to make ourselves do the opposite. Open the door, get as much light in as possible, invite somebody over. Now, it may not be a big problem for you, uh, but it may just be a mild symptom of oppression. But even just with the mild symptoms, we need to get rid of it, get take care of it. God has called us to be an overcomer in every area. Okay, the number five characteristic of demonic oppression <clears throat> is found many times in outbursts of emotions. We live in a physical body amid sometimes some very frustrating circumstances. Therefore, there's going to be occasions when outbursts of emotions come. So I'm not referring to that, because we're all going to have that from time to time. We're living in a fallen world. <clears throat> but I'm referring to regular outbursts of one kind or another. You know, maybe regular fits of temper, or regular fits of anger, or just regular fits of crying or despair. That We shouldn't be having regular fits of that. Uh, so that's something that we need to turn over to God and let Him deliver us and set us free in that area. Regular outbursts are symbolic of spiritual oppression. Now, when a person has little or no emotional control in some area, doesn't matter which area, when you maybe you don't have control over your temper, you don't have control over this or that, where maybe you fly off the handle at the least little thing, or maybe you cry uncontrollably, or dissolve into fits of depression, that's a sign of demonic oppression. Now, we've seen a lot of marriages break up simply because the mate just couldn't take living with those outbursts. That's hard on a mate, you know, if a person's just constantly having one outburst or another. You know, years ago, Frank and Ida Mae Hammonds came to Brownwood to do a deliverance seminar. And one couple in our church had just gotten their little adopted daughter from Korea. And that little baby would have outbursts of just screaming and crying. Well, the doctors had done everything they knew. They, had, uh, they couldn't find any medical reason. And the new parents, they were at their wits' end because this was happening constantly. Well, when the Hammonds got there, Ida Mae took the baby in her arms, and she just began to walk with it. And she walked and walked and walked. She walked around the, the, uh, the, the, the church room, and very softly she just was commanding that tormenting spirit to leave. She called it a tormenting spirit. And she spent a good while, she did that for... Uh, probably well over an hour, maybe two hours, just walking and commanding, and that baby never had an outburst again. I mean, the whole church was shocked because we didn't know what to do. We, we were uh, so uh, worried about the parents because they, did, they didn't know what to do. I praise God for deliverance. You know, we put up with things that God never intended us to put up with, and it's just because we're not receiving the gift of deliverance. And I hurt for people who don't know about it. Okay, the number six symptom of demonic oppression is in the last part of verse five. The demoniac was gashing himself with stones. He was cutting himself constantly. So number six symptom is an extreme here. It's self-destruction, when there's self-destruction. Now, we've all read or heard cases where people will do physical harm to himself. That, of course, is 
uh, obvious demonic oppression. But our objective today is not necessarily now to deal with the extreme evil that uh, spirits bring. Our objective today now is for us just to discern the minor form of these self-destructive things, and that's called self-rejection. We can see it when it's the, the big things, but sometimes we overlook these little things. So that's what I'm wanting us to center in on today. I want us to see those little things we're putting up with that God never intends us to put up with. And so this one, is, uh, it's not self-destruction, but self-rejection is a milder form. Now that may be hard to hear, but self-rejection is a form of demonic oppression every time. Everything in God's kingdom, everything that God asks of us is for our well-being, it's for our good. Now it's not for destruction or rejection ever. It's for our health and for our happiness. Now, when a pe person leans toward self-rejection, it's always a demonic oppression to some degree, anytime there's a self-rejection. Have you ever noticed how many times a person will do the very thing that's the worst thing that he could do in the situation for his own good? I've seen that happen so many times where the very worst thing they could do is, is what they're drawn to do. That's always the enemy. I've seen this with husbands and wives. A husband or a wife will be needing attention. They're, they're needing love from their mate. And yet they'll make some cutting remark or, or they'll nag or they'll do the very thing that brings rejection instead of love. And I've been amazed at how often I see that happening. But that's a demonic thing that needs to be turned over to the Lord. They need deliverance. A child at school needs acceptance, and many times they'll often pull the very thing that causes all the other kids to reject them and walk away from them, you know. Those things are not accidental. Those are demonic attacks. They're tendencies toward a spirit of self-rejection. Now, I've known of men who got angry at a situation, and they'd drive their fist through the wall. Well, who did that hurt, <laughs> you know? The only person he hurt was himself, and then he had to repair the wall, you know? But I've seen that happen so many times. Uh, we had a ministry of, of uh, deliverance, and I can't even begin to tell you how many times we'd be taking some man through deliverance, and he would say, when I get angry, I just have to break something. And uh, uh, that's a, a demonic attack. Spirit oppression causes us to do crazy things that hurt us. H have you ever been so angry at a situation that you picked up something that belonged to you, something that you really liked, and you threw it on the floor and smashed it? Okay, who did that spot? You know, I I've seen that happen before. Okay, that's a form of self-rejection. Even though we've all fallen for this at one degree or another, it's never Holy Spirit uh, inspired. Never is. So if it's not Holy Spirit inspired, we need to get rid of it. We need to let God deliver us. It's an evil spirit inspired. Any degree of self-rejection is a form of spirit oppression. And God doesn't want any of us, any of his children, to have spirit oppression. Okay, now verse 6. Uh, the demoniac got up and ran to Jesus. That's interesting. So inside of Legion was a man who wanted to follow God. It was a man who wanted help. He wanted it badly enough to run to Jesus and not run away from him. That needs to be something that we need to ask ourselves all the time. When something happens, do I run to the Lord? Do I run to him as quickly as I can? Or, or do I pull away in hurt or whatever. Do I do that? That's going to answer a lot of questions if we'll just ask that one simple question of ourselves. This man, this demoniac, he wanted it badly enough to run to God in spite of the extreme oppressing symptoms that were trying to pull him away. So that's a real clue. If Legion could submit to God in his extreme oppression and get set free, how much more can we submit in spite of our problems? our little mild problems, you know. Okay, number seven characteristic of demonic oppression is in the first part of verse seven. The man had already walked up to Jesus and bowed down in verse six, and yet he cried out with a loud voice. Okay, now the number seven characteristic of demonic oppression is with someone is always loud and disruptive. Now, just because a person is loud doesn't mean that he's demon oppressed. I'm not saying that. It's where and when he gets loud that lets you know if it's a demon oppression. 
where and when it happens. This oppression can show up uh, in the tone of voice or in the volume. Sometimes the volume can be loud and piercing. It can show up when the person continually has to talk all of the time for attention. You've been around people where they just they can't quit talking, you know, when no one else even has a chance to be seen or heard. When it's continually disruptive, it is some degree of demonic oppression. Now, a disruptive spirit can even manifest in praise, and you don't think about that, uh, but it can take over a service in a disorderly manner and take the attention away from God. We had one woman years ago, and she would start praising so loudly that all the attention would go to her, and the spirit of praise and worship would immediately lift off the place the minute she started. I mean, everybody just stop, you know. There are times when it's in order to praise God in a very loud voice. There's times, and it's usually when everybody's doing it. We're all together uh, praising and worshiping. But when others are in the awesome presence of God, and someone just belts out and breaks the spirit of worship, and it's disruptive, that's not God. Okay, number eight characteristic of demonic oppression is in the last part of verse seven. I ask you, Lord, do not torment me the demoniac said. Okay, so the number eight characteristic is the fear of punishment, the constant need to be punished, uh, the fear of being punished. Okay, now 1 John 4 verse 18, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. We need to memorize that. So hear me, demon spirits cannot experience love. Therefore, when they're under demonic oppression, anytime that somebody's under the demonic oppression, they can't fully accept God's unconditional love. God's offering it, but they can't accept it. There's always an underlying fear. Uh, There's the inability to accept fully the cleansing blood with the removal of the guilt and the consequences. Sometimes there's a fear of something happening to us or, or to our loved ones because we fear that we don't measure up. And uh, we fear that we don't deserve uh, the protection. And then there's the inability to get out from under that feeling that God is out to get me. You know, there's so many people that have that feeling, God's out to get me. God's not out to get us. God loves us. He's given his life for us. He, He gives us everything that we could need or want. But being constantly plagued with those kinds of thoughts and feelings is an indication of demonic oppression. If you'll just go down this list and look at these... Many times you'll think, oh, I do that, but I didn't realize I did that. So this list can really help us. Okay, number nine. Now Luke's account of the story of the demoniac says that he wore no clothing. Now this may sound a little insignificant and trivial, but it's not. Whenever there is a trend away from normal modesty, it's a characteristic of demonic activity, always. You know, I I went up into the college dorm of of the girls several years ago, and there was such a heavy demonic oppression in that dorm because of the lack of clothing being worn in their rooms and in the hall. And uh, it, it was an oppression. You could feel the oppression. There was a lewd, degrading spirit, and you could sense the uh, the spirit that the moment that you were on that floor, it was it was really embarrassing. Well, I found out later that one girl with a lewd spirit ran around on the floor without clothing, and she somehow had convinced the other girls that that's how it's supposed to be in all the dorms. That's just characteristic of of dorm living. A demon spirit is always trying to seduce others. Now, I was ministering to a woman from another church outside of Brownwood. Now, at one point in her life, she had become terribly demon-oppressed to the point of going out into public with, with no clothes. Well, later when she got set free, it was a horrible source of embarrassment and humi- humiliation to her. And uh, so demon activity becomes very humiliating. When there's something that's just constantly humiliating us, we need to realize there's a demon spirit involved. It's kind of like Norval Hayes says. He says, Satan is crazy, and he influences people to do crazy things. He influences them to do self-degrading things for which they're later so embarrassed. So embarrassment is another thing that Satan uses, and he tries to embarrass people in different ways. Now, unnatural immodesty is a sign of demon oppression. Public nakedness is a characteristic of extreme demonic oppression. But our objective today is to learn to recognize or discern minor manifestations of that same demonic oppression. And the trend in modern 
uh, uh, morality is to be more skimpily dressed. We see that in the world today. And to be more skimpily dressed is characteristic of demon oppression in a milder manifestation. Now, we recognize it in the extreme, but sometimes we don't recognize it when it's just skimpily dressed. But we need to realize that, too, is a, a part of the manifestation of the enemy. And that trend toward revealing more and more of our body leads to demonic activity. Now, if we stopped here, it'd be scary, and it would be very depressing. But I want us to look at the good news. In verse 10, uh, the demon begged Jesus not to send them out, out of the country. They were begging. Okay, notice the demons recognized the authority of Jesus, and they responded immediately to that authority. They knew the authority of Jesus, and they recognized it, and they responded. They had no power to withstand Christ's authority. Now, Luke 10, 19 says, I've given you all authority over the powers of the enemy, and he will not injure you. Okay, we have the same authority Jesus had if we use his name in faith. We need to realize that's been given to us. It's a gift that's been given. Now, demons are bound by what we permit or what we forbid. Some people don't stop to realize we have authority over the demonic realm, and they are bound by what we permit or what we forbid. You know, we think, oh, well, they're bound by if God for permits them or if he uh, forbids them. No, that power is put into our hands. We're the ones that God has given that power to, and those demons are bound by whatever it is that we permit or whatever it is that we, we forbid. Now, in verse 13, I want you to notice that the demons would rather live in the swine than go to their own place. They didn't want to go to their own place. They'd rather live in the swine. Those demons did not intentionally drive the swine into the sea. Demon oppression always leads to destruction, even when it's not the immediate uh, intention. They wanted the swine for a dwelling place, but the swine got panic-stricken with that sudden invasion of oppression, and they totally lost control of their senses, and they were driven to destruction. It's not the demon's intention to destroy us right away. That's what we need to realize. Demons don't intend to destroy us right away because they want to use our body. We need to realize that. So when mild oppression comes, and we tend to think, ah, oh, this oppression's not really that, it's not hurting anything, it's not that big a deal. We need to realize that we put up with things that we should be taking authority over because we need to realize that demon oppression always does eventually destroy in some area. Even though we think, ah, oh, that's not big, that big a deal. Yes, it will eventually bring destruction. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about death every time, but death in some areas. Death is simply the absence of life. And any area where we don't have the life of God flowing, there is destruction. Okay, now demons may hinder peace. They can be tormenting. They may even influence people at times to be disruptive and sometimes be destructive. They may even have such a disquieting uh, oppression you know, enough to drive a whole herd of swine <laughs> into destruction. But praise God, the good in news is that they are no match to the power of authority that's been given to us in Jesus' name. We need to stop and realize that. Yes, they do have power when we give in to them, but they are no match to the power and authority that has been given to us in the name of Jesus. That's the good news. That's what we need to see out of, out of this lesson. But there is more to, to deliverance than just casting out demons. The demoniac, he was clothed in his right mind, and, but he gave, he gave to the Lord. He submitted to the Lord. And verse 15, contrast this with verses 2 and 3. One little phrase here is very significant. It says he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. When we get our deliverance, we need to then ask ourselves, where am I going from here? What am I going to do now? You know, And the decision we make at that point is going to be life or death. It's going to be uh, hanging on to our victory or giving it away. Matthew 12, 44 warns us not to clean out the house and then leave it empty. Luke 10, 39, this is the Mary now uh, who had had the demons, and she's now sitting at the feet of Jesus, and she's listening to him. 
The demoniac was listening, sitting there with Jesus. In fact, uh, he even wanted to go with Jesus. He asked to go with him. The disciples who followed in the steps of their teacher soaked up of every word that he had to say. So it's not a matter of getting set free and then doing our own thing. Oh, good, I'm free now. I can do my own thing. No, I've never seen a successful lasting deliverance if the person was not willing to be discipled. That's the key. Back in Mark 5, verse 15, Legion didn't just get deliverance. He filled his house with the word of God at the feet of Jesus. So much so that Jesus sent him out to be a witness. He said, go out, tell it to the world. Now, Mark 5, verse 18 through 20, uh, Legion became such a powerful witness that the Bible says everyone was amazed. Don't you know there were many people who came to the Lord, you know, because of him? We may not have legions of, of demon spirits in us, but we've all been oppressed to some degree. And some arena is not quite what it needs to be until we get set free. So we can certainly learn from this story how to recognize some of the earmarks of demonic oppression. In fact, that's why this story is in the Bible, it's for us to learn from. It's not just to entertain us. And if the Gadarene demoniac can be delivered from legions, certainly we can get deliverance from whatever oppression that we're contending with. And we get it by yielding to the name of Jesus, making a disciple of ourselves sitting at the feet of Jesus. So go back and study these nine characteristics and then just be honest with yourself about areas where you're being harassed. And then just apply God's answers. That's what these stories are in here for. Use the name of Jesus and become discipled to obey his word. And then just sit back and watch the unbelievable thing that God will start doing in your life. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for these uh these stories in the Bible. Sometimes we read the uh, the stories of the demoniacs and, and these, and we think, oh, why is that in the Bible? That's in the Bible so that we'll get set free. We may not be the extreme uh, case that the demoniac was, but we all have areas, every one of us have areas in our life where it can be so much better. And so, Father, I pray that we'll look through these stories and we'll examine them and we'll search out everything that you're trying to show to us in these different stories. And then we'll say, okay, Lord, I'm going to put it to work now. And we're not going to be able to believe how free we can become. We're not going to be able to even believe how, how wonderful life can be. Even when we think we're doing it right, when we think we're doing a good job, there's always room for more improvement. And God's wanting us to absolutely take everything he has and and apply it and become more like Jesus every single day. Father, that's our prayer. That's what we want. And we say thank you, Lord, for these examples in the Word of God that just tell us word for word what to do. In Jesus' name, amen.